All right, guys, welcome. We're joining midstream here with what's happening, a live announcement from Minister Miller. And so let's slide over and let's tune in. Institution framework in time for the fall semester of 2024. The framework would recognize those institutions whose international students benefit from top class services, with what's happening, housing, live and other supports. Our goal here is to punish the bad actors, make sure that they are held accountable, and reward the good actors who provide adequate outcomes for the success of international students. Such institutions that are recognized could benefit from, for example, faster student permit application processing destined for the students destined to their school. And as we move towards implementing it next year, additional details will be shared to fully Very explain good, how Minister. institutions would become good. recognized and what benefits that would bring. I would also caution people who have demanded for a one-stop solution, that we put a cap on things, uh, that we sort of bring down okay, the hammer no on caps. an ecosystem. Here we go, no caps. With perverse incentives. I've met enough people in this field to know that the lived experience of international students is too complex to come up with a simple formula and simply... I can kind of pause this, fortunately, and then I can restart it. So basically, just to get you guys up to speed to what's happening, the minister is talking about some new measures that they're putting in place to try to protect international students, to, um, to kind of curtail the fraud that's going on. They really emphasize the fake um, offer letters from schools, the fact they're putting in a program to, um, to verify that all offers to these international uh, to, to schools that um, are offering admission to international students that they're all legitimate just to avoid the nightmare that happened. Um, it's all about trying to, to curb fraud within the program. Now, <clears throat> huge numbers, January to August, 608,000 new requests for internet for, for study permits this year. So it's a massive, massive undertaking. And as you can see here, I've just paused it. The, the what's going on right now is that the minister was wrestling with the decision. Do we put caps in or not? It sounds like maybe that's not the case. Um, he talked about the, uh, the 1150 fraudulent applications that happened previously um, uh, that they detected. And they said, you know, there were a large portion of them um, were detected in advance and curtailed, but there are over 400 that were uh, that slipped through the cracks that then became this big news media uh, frenzy earlier this year. And they talked about how there were a certain number of those students that were genuine, that truly didn't know, and they were offered different measures and others were, were clearly found to be um, complicit with what was going on. Um, so they're instituting uh, this these new program to enhance the verification of admission letters and then also recognize institutions. So basically, um, I think some of the, the private schools that maybe you know, their sole purpose is to is to create um, study permits for, you know, for international students and post-grad work permits. Uh, well, they're, they're going to start cracking down on, I think, a, a lot of the private schools. We'll see what the minister has to say here. All right, let's continue. We have the federal government stomp in and pretend that it has all the solutions. My job is to solve for fraud and to make sure that my department and the federal government is doing its job. But I do want to add that... Uh, The accreditation, the designation of designated learning institutions is made by provinces. And they have a primary okay. role in this. Come on, Minister, don't sure pass the buck. That those institutions are doing their jobs. We have a challenge in Ontario in particular, but it is not okay. the only province that has faced challenges. Okay, I'm going to stop it here. So now what he's getting into is the posturing. So immigration has made the decision to issue the study permits, but absolutely education is a provincial matter and provinces must absolutely must connect <clears throat> into this issue and, uh, and be there to help and protect against, against fraud. Absolutely. You know, when it comes to schools and granting charters to schools, we really, really need to do a good job at a provincial level of making sure that the schools are truly good, reputable schools. You know, anytime we have, uh, you know, a bunch of schools that just are not up to up to the, the quality of education that, that Canada has been known to, it just waters down the program. It waters down the system entirely. And um, it devalues all of the, you know, the education that's been obtained at, at, at you know, of other international students who come to Canada um, when Canada is no longer recognized as a global leader because of all of these, you know, potentially, and I don't 
I'm not heavily involved in the industry on the, the uh, education agency side of things, but there are a number of schools that have not been up to, to snuff when it comes to the quality of education that would justify the issuance of study permits. So I think this is kind of one of the things they're, they're looking at uh, is, a, is a more trusted program uh, for schools that are, they're obviously awesome schools. Now, with that being said, the minister is talking about the, uh, the balance of powers, essentially, when it comes to um, the, the jurisdiction of the provinces over education and then the jurisdiction of immigration and the issuance of study permits with, uh, with the federal government. So we'll see what he has to say about this. Hopefully he's not passing the buck and saying, hey, it's not just our fault because Minister Miller and IRCC has really taken it on the chin with the international student program. But we need to do it together. Uh, and the federal government is coming forward and opening its arms to our provincial partners, territorial partners, to make sure, sure we all do our jobs properly. Good. If that job can't be done, the federal government is prepared to do it. Good. But for right now, Good. we need the provinces in particular, um, and in the case of Ontario where we are, to look at the Auditor General report that was issued in 2021 with respect to public and private colleges, Yep. and work on implementing some of those recommendations. Absolutely. They are key to the vitality of the people that I spoke to today. They are key to the integrity of the system. I'm just going to stop it there. What the minister's getting at is that some of the provinces have been kind of lax in issuing charters. They've been kind of lax in monitoring the quality of education that some of the schools have been turning out. And the auditor's report that he's talking about back in 2021 issued a, a series of recommendations. And so the minister is saying, look, provinces, get on board, clean up your, your backyard, or we will do it for you. And of course, they have to, because no one thinks about the provinces when you know international students are being exploited. The only thing they think about is the federal government and IRCC and Minister Miller. So if the provinces don't take immediate action, then guess what's going to happen? And he's, you can see, why is he targeting Ontario? Because 49% of all international students end up going to Ontario. At least that historically has been the trend. So good on you, Minister Miller. And they are key to what Janet so aptly said, is responsible growth. I'm not here to shut down a business model that makes sense. But what we are seeing in the ecosystem is, is one that has been chasing after short-term gain. Okay, he's talking about the greed that exists in the international student uh, in that realm. And we know, you guys, we know that there is billions of dollars that are, that are you know, <laughs> that are being generated by this industry, both legitimately, um, the schools rely heavily on the, you know, the three times the tuition that international students are playing, uh, that are paying, the institutions themselves rely heavily on it. And when it comes to, uh, when it comes to the, uh, the, the fraud that's out there, I have to assume that it's 10 times the, the, the revenue that's being generated because of the fraud. Um, now, not in good ways, and this is what the minister is trying to tackle, but he's identifying and recognizing that where there's a buck to be made, there are seedy characters out there looking to exploit. And where there are people that are just can't find a way to Canada, you know, they're, they're trying to figure out how do I qualify for express entry? Well, you get more points for international studies when you're here in Canada. So, and it opens up the door to work permits and pathways that otherwise may not exist for, uh, for an international, like for a foreign national. So we'll see how, let's see what else the minister has to say. Without looking at the long-term pain, and we need to reverse that trend, but it will take time. And a simple solution is not the one that we're presenting today. We will gradually move into it and make sure that we do our job first as a federal government, but work with our provincial counterparts to make sure that that job is done in a way that keeps international students like the ones I spoke to today at the heart of every decision-making process. Okay, I'm going to pause it. What he said there, you have to read between the lines. He said, right now, we're not going to do some kind of a knee-jerk cap and just which is actually quite surprising because the Liberal government, that's their bread and butter is these big massive announcements. But at this stage, they're being smart. They're not, uh, you know, they're not just deciding to institute a cap and just close off all international students, um, you know, or, or limit the number from certain countries, which has also been alluded to in the past. Remember, Minister Fraser previously, right here, this fellow, he previously hinted in the past that they were going to try to spread out the international students to give opportunities for students from many countries so that it's not just from a certain few. 
He hinted at that, and we haven't heard or seen anything further on that. But Minister Miller right here is saying he's not closing the door, you guys. So do not be surprised if, as they figure things out, that they do start to institute some forms of, of, of restrictions or caps or targets uh, for certain areas, for certain countries. Don't be surprised. But right now, they're not, they're not just jumping the gun. Um, finally, I'd add because this, and I won't add too much detail to this because it is a work in progress, we also want to signal our plans to introduce reforms to the post-graduation work permit program. We know that there is an arc to this. People don't just come to the country to study and necessarily to leave. Some do, but we know that this is also a pathway to permanent residency and Canadian citizenship eventually, but it has to go through a program that makes sure that we are incentivizing, incentivizing the trades that are in such great need in this country. Okay, did you hear that? That's very, very interesting. So we'll, we'll get to, you'll get to more of what he's talking about. That They're also looking at examining the post-grad work permit program. And whenever the minister takes the time to isolate or highlight a particular industry, what did he just say? Trades. Right now, there's no programs that allow individuals to come in to study as a trade and then transition to a post-grad work permit. Very, very few. I shouldn't say there's none, but the way the trades are set up in Canada, it becomes extremely difficult um, because when they come and study often trades, like if you're a welder, a carpenter, a mechanic, you know, I've got brothers, you know, who, who, who are trades and who've gone through these programs. And often they're not like a full one year program where you can then get a postgrad work permit. You come go to school for four months, then you go work for a little bit, then you come back and do another three or four months. So I'm very curious to hear what he's going to say, because I think it's brilliant to open up those avenues to people who want to come learn a trade in Canada and then transition and become um, a postgrad work permit holder and PR. So I'm really interested in this. Being a farm kid, um, you know, I, I understand the value of of trade, uh, the trades to, to Canada's economic recovery, especially this housing nightmare that we have. We have a labor shortage in this country and it cannot be filled domestically. That is no, the reality cannot. of the aging population that we have. And yep. it's the reality that we need to face in a responsible fashion. If we are to grow our gross domestic product responsibly, but also if we were to have all the services that all the aging population expects Absolutely. us to have in a country like Canada. And let's face it, you guys, young Canadians don't want to work in the trades. They don't want to be outside in the cold with the snow, you know, building houses, right? They would rather be inside, you know, doing more knowledge-based work. Now, that's not saying that there isn't Canadians that get into the trades, obviously. And I'll be honest, there's some days, you guys, where I'm sitting here in my, in my office thinking to myself, um, boy, am I in the right industry? Am I, you know, uh, I would love if I had a choice now, no, I shouldn't really say that. But sometimes I think to myself, boy, I wish I could just go back to the farm, just raise cattle, just ranch, have my horses and just have a peaceable life. <laughs> but we, but, but whatever, I have a family, I have an elderly mother, I've got extended family that rely on me financially. And so I do, and just like you guys, we, we do things for a better future for our family. And don't get me wrong, I love immigration. Of all of the areas of law that I could practice, this is the one that I love the most because of this stuff. But let's, uh, yeah, so I get it. But not every Canadian wants to work in the trades. Okay, let's get back to the minister here. The program that I'm speaking about hasn't been reviewed in a decade and has grown considerably in parallel without inc um, with the increasing number of This is the post-grad work Canada. permit program. In the coming months... Uh, we'll do continued work to make sure that we actually align this to the arc that I was speaking about to make sure that someone that is coming here for studying can get a job and can move into uh, perhaps a pathway to permanent residency. So I would ex expect to announce more details uh, in the coming months on that particular okay. piece of the reform. Okay, so reforming the post-grad work permit program with a particular interest in carving out something for trade-level positions. What are trades? Welders right? They're welders, electricians, carpenters, pipe fitters, okay? All these individuals, uh, plumbers, all right? That's what he specifically identified. And when they do that, I listen. Um, I'd also add that in the last year, we've brought online new technologies that assist with study permit renewals that use an automated tool to review applications and provide a summary yes. to officers for a final decision. Why don't you just say artificial that intelligence? That the final decision always rem remains with a human yeah. and case officers.
Okay, once again, he's saying, be prepared, you guys. AI is here. Artificial intelligence is here. We are using it. And uh, let's face it, I don't have a problem uh, with the utilization of artificial intelligence. This can be a very, very meaningful tool to streamline applications, especially, especially extension applications from within Canada. Heck, when you're applying to extend, if you're already in school, you're fully compliant with the, the terms and conditions of your temporary stay. Why do you need to waste hours and hours to review a study permit extension application or a work permit extension application, provided that the individual is eligible and you can use artificial intelligence to determine that and to process approvals, you bet. And then the minister once again is saying, okay, but understand, you know, it's not just we're turning it over to robots here. This is, uh, there are real officers who are refusing the applications. Well, we've had issues with that in the past and we've got huge, you know, huge concerns with the way in which overseas initial study permit applications are being processed. I just had one refused just the other day. It was uh, the clients had filed two separately, two previous applications. And then more recently, we'd put together a rock solid study permit application and it got refused. So we will absolutely be judicially reviewing it. But I have no doubt in my mind it was AI that triaged it and an officer did not look at the whole application, did not look at the whole application, but just rejected it. So we will be fighting for that client and we will get it approved. But that's what happens when you use AI and officers don't take a careful look at the applications. Um, this has approved our processing time and it's really something we need to do in the context yep. of the 21st century. AI does century. process applications um, faster, Minister. Our immigration system is reliable and will continue to act to prevent fraud by criminals and unscrupulous actors. I remain committed to supporting all genuine students who came here with hopes and dreams, hopefully doing what we need to do better in matching supply and demand. Um, that's why we're acting here today to support hardworking people and ensure our systems are secure and effective. I can't do it, we can't do it, the provinces can't do it without people like Dr. Morrison, without institutions like Sheridan College and all the ones that are essential to the future and our responsible growth in this country. So I know perhaps some of you have questions. I'll leave oh, it yes. at that and simply want to thank you for taking the time uh, to come here today. Merci. One of my first questions is, Minister, you say the end of the year and you guys are so fantastic about, about, you know, vague references to when these things will kick into place. So in terms of the credential, the, the admissions, the verification of admission letters, that was the first thing he talked about right here. The second thing that he talked about was um, a, a trusted kind of school program where, um, you know, where, where good schools are being rewarded um, with the ability to, you know, to, to have their DLI designation, right? So I wonder if some schools are going to be delisted. So the designated learning institutions that are now on the list and they are extremely broad, is the minister going to institute a delisting of schools that previously were that no longer are going to have that level of accreditation? And I have to assume that they're going to rely on the provinces to determine which schools are good or not. And then if the provinces um, determine after following the direction of that 2021, um, uh, that, that, that work that was done, those proposals that were done back in 2021 on, on revamping or, or, or correcting some of the problems within the education, um, th that realm, uh, if the provinces don't institute those things, um, then I guess the, the federal government will step in and, and do things to, to, to try to sort out and weed out uh, the schools that are just really not up to the level that we would like them to be when it comes to um, the high caliber of education that we take pride in. And guys, let's face it. I was a former teacher. I was a high school teacher before I became a lawyer. And when I look at all of the, the, the changes that have occurred, even in my professional lifetime, which is the last 20 years, so much has changed. So much has changed. Never before have international students, um, uh, the, the demand for them and the money that they bring creates such a massive industry as, as it is today. And to a large extent, what was the impetus for it? It was express entry. When it became more and more difficult for international, well, for foreign nationals to qualify directly through express entry, and points were given for international studies and for in-Canada work experience, it opened up Pandora's box for every person who couldn't otherwise qualify for express entry to, to pursue the international student program. And so 
the express entry has caused a lot of this. There's ripple effects with everything. So we'll just have to see how this plays out. Okay, let's let's check out these questions that people are asking and let's see if there's some of the ones that you and I both have going on in our mind. All right, what is what do we got here? So thank you, uh, Minister Miller. Uh, I am very much looking forward to seeing the impact this announcement will have on learners who often at great personal sacrifice and with an abundance of courage choose Canada and come to our great country from around the world. And don't forget, spend hundreds of thousands of dollars in some cases going through a four-year program or you know, or, or master's degree or, or PhD, okay? Don't forget, dear school, Sheridan College, you're getting a freaking boatload of money from these international students. I just want to underscore... And she didn't say it. I have a lot of experience talking to learners and alumni. These students, graduates, are extraordinary. They're talented and smart, engaged, ambitious, and they will go on to drive economic and social outcomes for Ontario, for Canada, and the world. I, I, I agree could brag with that. about Sheridan's International alumni I agree. for hours and hours and yeah, hours. It's not just you, but Sheridan. Those, but these, you guys, the international students who come, by and large, are exceptional. Hardworking, just like she said. Dedicated. Willing to make sacrifices. Willing to work. So I can tell you within my office, absolutely. Um, I, yeah, I, I see that play out within even my firm time and time again. The dedication, the drive, the commitment uh, of international students. So absolutely, they graduate, they will become leaders in this country. I agree with her. Learners current and perspective deserve bold leadership and the highest standards of system integrity. On behalf of everyone here today, thank you, Minister, for your unwavering commitment to delivering on that imperative. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us. I'll now turn it over to the IRCC team to navigate media inquiries. Have a great day, everyone. Okay, now one thing I want to point out before they get to the questions, they must recognize that not all international students are interested in following the rules, that are interested in, in you know, uh, in basically coming to Canada through legit legitimate means. It doesn't matter what type of immigration program, whether it's permanent residence, whether it's work permits, study permits, even visit, visit, visitor records, coming to visit. There will always be people who may not otherwise qualify, who have no problem issuing, you know, utilizing fraudulent documents, like paying extra money to be able to get a pathway that they may not otherwise have been able to attain. And so that exists absolutely. And I'm hopeful that the, the steps that they're taking now will help to curb some of that. But wherever there's an opportunity and wherever people have money to pay for that opportunity, there will always be people looking to, to take advantage of, of, of gaps in, this, in, in, in the security of those systems. And so like they talked about Mr. Miller with the 1,150 students or whatever that were affected by the fraudulent admission letters, he confirmed that there were over 40 or more that they were aware of that got through out of the 400 that for sure were complicit in every way with, and they knew what was happening, right? And that's really, really hard to prove subjectively what's in someone's mind. Um, so those individuals exist out there, but the vast majority are good, decent people looking, excuse me, looking for a better opportunity for themselves and their future who want to follow the rules, who are trying to do it right. But because of unscrupulous actors, they are 100% exploited and taken advantage of and left with no options when they come to Canada. And they are afraid. They will not speak out. They will not rat out the person who exploited them, their family, took tens of 20, 30, 40, 50, whatever, how many thousands of dollars for these fake admission letters with no mechanism really in their mind to, to correct it because they just don't trust the system. And I've tried as a lawyer, immigration lawyer, for years to get people to come forward when I've seen this time of this type of corruption. And this is an opportunity I really want to let you guys know that if you don't say stuff, if you come over and you just keep your mouths closed, this type of fraud will continue. And it just it blows my mind how often I see 
individuals so willing to screw their own countrymen. Ukrainians taking advantage of Ukrainians. Indians taking advantage of Indians. You know, Ecuadorians taking advantage of Ecuadorians. And it's, by and large, there's Canadians, natural born and bred, exploiting and taking advantage of people overseas. Absolutely. But there's this level of inherent trust that you have with someone from your country who speaks your language, right? There's this level of trust and you just expect more of them. And then when they take advantage of you, often people don't want to come forward. And so as long as people are not coming forward and don't get me started on the whole job offer scam, you know, 30, 40, $50,000 for job offers and, and Canadian employers who are doing that, my goodness, I'd love to shut down every single one of those. But you have to come forward when this type of fraud exists. Otherwise, this stuff will never happen. And one thing I'll point out is that IRCC was already trying to do some investigations into the background on this back at the beginning of the year before it all came, it was all blown up in, in you know, uh, when they started to refuse. Uh, but pe- not enough people came forward. People stayed silent and that was the issue. All right, let's see what these questions are. Um, from the media. We'll have a few on the floor and then we'll go to some questions on the line. If you could uh, say your uh, your outlet and your name, that'd be fantastic. We'll go here first. Hi, good morning. My name is Hamreen. I'm from Punjab TV. Uh, Mr. Miller, my question to you is since we know that uh, international students are con- considered an integral part of our uh, country, but we have seen that uh, when students enroll themselves in any colleges or universities and uh, once the first semester is over, just a couple of days before the second semester commences, there is a sudden increase in the hike of the fee, in the fee, which is considered a major problem because then students have to go all the way out of their budget to just, uh, you know, compensate for that money that they have to pay to the colleges and universities. What's your take on that? Okay, I'm going to put some context on here, okay, what she just asked. This is where the, the, the money, the, the money that, that creates the corruption, okay? When money is there to be made and the schools are as guilty as anyone because of the reliance they have on these international students. The question was, and what's happened is students will, will, will come, they will study, they will pay that first semester's tuition. Maybe it's even the first year. I guess it depends on schools. And then there will be a jump in tuition after they come. They'll say, oh, now we're raising the tuition. And once the student's already here, they base their whole budget on the fact that tuition would be this much. But then the school is like, oh, hey, we're just gonna double your tuition. Now, I don't know if that's actually the case, but they do. So the question to the minister is, what are you gonna do about this? You know, when you've got schools that hold out one thing, it's only gonna cost this much. And then, and I can tell you that this, the tuition, at public schools is is locked in. And yes, there's abilities for them to increase it, but this often happens at the private school level. Okay, let's hear what the minister has to say. I have, so I have, I have lots of views on, on that. Uh, in other words, that's code for, oh my goodness, what the heck am I going to say? How do I answer that? You know, I, I get, I have the privilege of seeing uh, this this ecosystem that's been created from, um, a thousand foot perspective. I, I have been an international student myself, uh, so I'm not going to pretend, uh, but I'm not going to pretend that, that, that I have the experience that, uh, that, that, that uh, I heard today from, from the three students that spoke to us so poignantly about their experience and their pathway to Canada. Um, we know that there has been uh, consistent underfunding of post-secondary education uh, particularly mm-hmm. by provinces, uh, depending yep. on the province over the years. And institutions are smart and have adapted to that. That has yep. gone uh, through, at times, opportunistic fees that have been charged to international students to um, to close a gap that is really an unnatural one and shouldn't be the case in, in, in a country like, like Canada. So basically what he's saying is, this is kind of like a dig at the provinces. He's saying provinces have, have underfunded the post-secondary institutions to the point where In order for them to function, they have to rely on international students. And he also hinted and acknowledged that some schools have taken advantage of that. And they know that the students are in a vulnerable position. They know they don't have a choice. And so they will bump up the tuition as a cash grab. So 
uh, you know, or to meet shortfalls that they are projecting within the schools. So let's see what else he has to say. That's a reality that we all have to start talking about. Um, it's created a sense, and I, I, I've talked a lot about fraud, but there is also perverse incentives that have been created as a result, and they've magnified greatly yes. over the course of the last three years, and particularly as we exited from COVID. So what you're saying is, uh, is only a small example of, uh, of a system that is very, very lucrative, um, not necessarily for the federal government, but for institutions um, and provinces that um, have had a model of underfunding a post-secondary education. Okay, I don't know why he lumped in provinces with that, uh, because the provinces aren't getting any money. <laughs> this is, the, the provinces are the ones who use taxpayer dollars to, to fund. And I'll, put, I'll point something out here. This is one of the challenges too. Absolutely, there's underfunding by the provinces. Absolutely. But the money has to come from somewhere, okay? And this is the part that just really drives me crazy. The money just doesn't grow on trees. It comes from taxpayer, a tax base. And so if our country is struggling and, you know, uh, families are struggling to even meet the basic, you know, the basic staples of life to put a house over their head, you know, to, to feed their families, to have meaningful jobs that, that cover this skyrocketing inflation in our country. Okay. The reality is um, when it comes to taxes, the government is fighting to try to figure out at a provincial level how to redistribute that because it's not just education, it's healthcare that's suffering. It's all aspects of, of you know, of, of government supports. We are a socialist country. But if the taxpayer, the tax base that we have is not sufficient to, you know, to, to have the money, then there's a reason that the schools are being underfunded. They're making difficult decisions on where to, to, where to, to send that, those dollars. And when schools are 85 or 90% foreign nationals, now some of the private colleges are, um, you know, they, well, in those schools, they, they, they rely heavily, almost exclusively in some cases on the tuition and public schools, you know, uh, universities, things like that also now are relying heavily on international students to just meet their budgetary demands. And that goes all across the board from the, the, the skyrocketing, you know, salary of, of professors to, you know, the, the, just the overall costs of running a university. And, um, and I have no issues with professors making the money that they are deserving of. They spend how many years, you know, developing an expertise in their, in their field and then sharing that knowledge with future generations. I have no issues with it, but the model has to make sense just like any other business. And, um, it's a supply demand thing. And that's what we're dealing with right now. All right, let's hear some more from the minister. It is a big issue that we need to discuss. Um, but I'm not the minister in control of that. And I lose oh, credibility. Oh, don't pass the buck. When, Come on. Um, your I'm government. In people's business. It's your I government. Absolutely, when I speak to students and hear their experiences, I have the, Sorry, I'm too I have loud the, here. the, the absolute I'm getting responsibility too passionate. To, to speak about it. Um, but I need to be at the table with those that, uh, that need to fix it. This is the case. Okay, this is the part that drives me crazy. Okay, minister, you are in power. It is your government. It is you guys, and you can't pass the buck and say, well, I'm not responsible for that. Like, what is that? You say, yes, you're right, and I'm going to be you know, integrally involved in, 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 in trying to find a solution. That's the answer. Oh, man, that's frustrating. Uh, and I've talked about Ontario today, but this is the case in Quebec as well, and it's the case in other, in, in other provinces. I don't blame the institutions for having uh, adapted, um, and I don't blame the students for, uh, for their willingness to come to a country like Canada. But it is one that um, costs a lot and has real human repercussions. And what we're seeing more and more that we hadn't perhaps seen 10 years ago is this is having an impact on students looking for housing. Uh, and uh, I don't want to blame in any measure international students for the housing crisis that uh, governments, including in the way you are, ones federally have spent decades not in the way you in. are, Minister. Um, but it is a reality that those students are in a much more precarious position than they have been uh, in a prior generation. And I think those the reason they're in a precarious position, Minister, is because the number of international students that have been admitted into Canada has skyrocketed astronomically, astronomically, at a pace that our housing market just hasn't been able to keep up with. 
And it has been the large volumes of temporary residents that have come into Canada through work permit measures. There's only so many houses and people only die at a certain rate. People are living longer. And even though they're temporary, the vast, large, large number of temporary residents that come in want to seek permanent residence. So um, they need to acknowledge that. And in this case, the Liberal government and, and um, IRCC's policies um, have, have related and, and affected directly the housing market. You can't say that it hasn't. That would be disingenuous. Those are all discussions I think as a country we can overcome. <clears throat> But we need everyone at the we table can. to start talking about this. It's um, true. Again, I'll repeat again. My job isn't to is, is not to um, turn off the tap to responsible growth, but it's to talk about responsibility and making sure that we are all doing our jobs properly. Um, I can't fix fees overnight. We have federal government has very little to say in the fees that are charged. True. But you we do. are aware that it's happening. Yeah. Perfect. So we'll continue on the floor with uh, global news. It's one question, one follow up. That was a great question. Uh, Minister Miller, uh, my question is about the task force that you talked about. Um, what is the mandate of this task force? Is it specifically about the 263 cases or is it, uh, are we possibly looking at a long-term sort of a tribunal that looks at all of these cases to make sure, as you said, that uh, people who are victims of this fraud are not punished with uh, measures such as deportation uh, in some cases? Yeah, and I, I, I'll take a step back and say that uh, not every, and just to be clear, not every issue and element of fraud will be addressed uh, by today's announcement. This will be progressive, and it will be able to achieve some of the outcomes in, in, uh, in cutting out some of the clear cases of outright fraud. Uh, so that's important. The task force plays a really important role in the cases that I spoke about today, and we can give you all the details in, in, in where that work is uh, in a little more detail than what I provided to you today. But we will absolutely ready to expand the task force to have a greater mandate as we see cases arise because um, there needs to be an adjudicative process that is not uh, that goes far beyond the minister exercising his discretion in this case so um, that's part of the tool tools in the toolbox we'll be able to use to expand uh, their ability to look into to cases of people that have been tricked or um, or themselves have have been the victim of fraud knowingly and, and, and I think there's, there's gray areas in there that we have to deal with um, some level of humanity. But the reality is, is if you've committed fraud and you're in this country, um, you don't have any particular business staying here. Uh, I'm going to stop right there. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. This is something that I have not heard them say very frequently. So props to you, Minister Miller. If someone has knowingly engaged in fraud and it, can be proven that they have engaged in fraud. I am 100% behind them being deported, removed from the country as fast as possible and forever lose their opportunity to be here. Full stop. Okay. So I really appreciate the minister brought that up. But here's the problem. Individuals in that situation, even those who have been taken advantage of, they will never ever come forward. They won't. They will suffer in silence. And this is what leads to the horrible consequences you know individuals that are just trapped it's literally like human trafficking who who thought they were going to be starting school at this great school and they're excited for their future in Canada their family had paid all this money all to fake education agents who have exploited them and there are good education agents out there there are crappy ones and yeah, even the introduction where they talked about unscrupulous consultants you know they exist I see them all the time and anytime I see any immigration lawyer, and there are some out there, I have come across them, who are even remotely involved in this type of a scam, they get reported to the law society as fast as possible. I just wish that the, the, the regulators, that there was a better way of regulating education agents, because I think this is what's contributing to it. You know, the, the whole scheme with schools paying agents percentages to, to link up schools you know, students with their schools. I think I don't like that industry at all. It's, it's open for huge corruption, but I'm going to, I'll leave that aside, but good on you minister for acknowledging. Um, but there absolutely needs to be pathways for people who were truly, truly exploited and had no knowledge of the fraud going on. So there needs to be protections in place for them. Um, but it's really, really hard to tell the difference what's in someone's mind. 
an outcome that's different than that undermines the credibility of the system and the really bright students that have um, come here in good faith. Yes, it's you all talk, about good faith. You talked about uh, the sky-high fees that international students pay, and you also talked about who has what responsibility. I'm wondering what you think about the fact that um, colleges and universities earn tens, if not hundreds of millions from international student tuition. Uh, what do you think of the notion that colleges and universities have an obligation to ensure affordable housing for international students that come in? If you're going to bring in people into this country, you also have an obligation as the person earning this uh, windfall revenue uh, to house international students. Uh, okay, it's not a windfall revenue. And I, I hate when reporters ask these loaded questions. The revenue in some cases for private schools could be seen uh, if their 100% uh, to student body is, is foreign nationals, international students, then yeah, maybe you call that a windfall because I don't believe those, those levels of education that are coming out of some of those schools are where we want them to be in terms of the caliber of education. But it's not a windfall. Like these schools, it's unbelievably expensive by the time, like I said, you've paid the professors and the, and the instructors and the teachers and all the support staff and just to keep lights on in these institutions. It is really expensive. And so education is expensive. And so I wouldn't classify it as a, as a windfall revenue, but I agree. They should play a role in, in ensuring that there is a place for these students to live when they come. And if that means investing in building in more dorms and residences on campus, maybe that's something they need to look at and have responsibility over for sure. You know, the NDP has spoken about this. I wonder what your view of that is. Oh, I, I, I agree with it. Um, I'm not going to force institutions to, to, to build housing, uh, but I think some of the intel, more intelligent aspects of the recognized institution framework is that it does have criteria in it that will make people eligible to be part of that group if they can demonstrate that they have um, proper housing for those students, uh, what the measures they've taken to make sure that students are properly housed, yes. what measures they take to accompany students in, uh, in their challenges with mental health. You know, years ago, we weren't talking about mental health. We are talking about mental health today. It's a huge and we raised, issue. It was raised today as a really important factor in how, how, how institutions deal with uh, the student experience. I'll just stop here, and, and I apologize for stopping because I want you to understand what's happening in the background. So we know that, you know, students that have been exploited who come here, you know, some of them end up taking their lives, which is a horrific situation, just because they're caught in this vortex of just, there's just so much um, opportunity for corruption within the way the system is designed right now. And what the minister is saying here is that, okay, like, I'm not going to force schools to make sure there's housing for people to live, but he is hinting at the fact that this trusted school you know, program that they're going to, that they're going to, uh, uh, to, to launch. And let's see, what do they call it? I'm trying to remember from the earlier, basically it was, it was one of the reforms was, um, was to set up a, um, a recognized institution program. I think that's what they called it. In order to be a part of that, you're going to have to check certain boxes. And so this is a way that they can kind of like, a uh, giving them a carrot versus a stick. <laughs> so not punishing them, you know, by saying, if you don't do this, um, then we're not going to allow you to bring any students. Instead, what they're going to say, if you want to be part of the recognized institution program, then you have to show that you have all of these supports in place for your students so that their transition to Canada will be a healthy one that isn't going to result in, you know, um, just horrific psychological costs and, and that, you know, just driving people to mental illness because of um, depression, all these things, and suicide because they just had no clue what they needed to have in place when they came. And I think this is a huge issue. And I think education agents, if they're being paid to to find spots for for um, you know uh, people seats at schools, admissions, that they and the school should take an active role in making sure that uh, that that kids are protected. All right, let's keep listening. And a couple of other categories that 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 will be part of the indicators as to whether an institution is yes. recognized, therefore yep. being eligible to an exp expedited process and a light yep. touch on the visa process, um, and those that are not. Um, yep. I would stress again that provinces do have a role in making sure yep. in uh, their DLI model that uh, there is housing, uh, you know, the worst. And just to reiterate, you heard right there, IRCC, <clears throat> defers to the provinces in terms of DLIs, designated learning institutions. 
So what the minister is hinting at, although I'm sure they've got some involvement, the, the provinces are responsible for setting up those DLI lists, those DLI, um, you know, the schools that are authorized to, um, uh, you know, to admit students who can obtain study permits. So let's keep going. The, the, the worst of, the, of, of sort of the private colleges are storefront fly-by-night operation, and they're really leaving, um, they're really dashing people's Horrible. hopes in this country that, yes. that are coming here, and uh, those need to be shut down. And so you can hear that this this is something I love. So basically, like you said, the storefront, fly-by-night, garbage private schools that are really not schools. They're just there to exploit and take money from people. The minister confirmed, yes, we need to shut these down. And so welcome. Like that's, what would I do? What do I do here? Let me think. Uh, I'm looking to see. Oh, I don't even have it. I don't think. I was gonna, I was gonna play some applause there for the minister. But we'll, we'll leave it at that. Okay, we must be getting fairly close. We'll take our first question from the line now. So these are regular people asking questions now. The media had their first shot. Oh, I've got questions, Minister. Okay. Unfortunately, I'm not there. Some technical difficulties. We'll, uh, we'll continue with questions on the floor. I think we have Filipino TV over here. Filipino TV. Good morning, Mr. Minister, and good morning to all the officers. My question is in behalf of the many uh, international students that we talk to in our station. Filipino TV is in the middle of making a documentary on international students in Canada. And many of their concerns are from the pathway from being international students to being permanent residents. Mm -hmm. A lot of them have been working and have been contributing to the companies where they're working now. I'm actually one of the examples, I was a former international student as well and i'm also one of those waiting but then i'm asking for them for us including me also but like um a lot of them they say are in the cec canadian experience class yeah. and they've been waiting Ask for it. more than two why years, no some cec until draws years, some until six years and while they're waiting there's a lot of challenges like the just to to maintain your status here in canada i'm just going to pause this okay waiting Four or five years. This this person, what they should be asking is, why have there not been any CEC draws? What the heck is going on? And I, I talked earlier about the fact that just this year alone, at the beginning of the year, at least for the first, what, what was it? It was the uh, January to August, okay? Half of the year, January to August. Do you know how many new applications were submitted? The minister confirmed 608,000. That's for half of the year for just this year. 608,000. If you look at the levels plans and you know what? I'm going to pull this up right now. Let's look up let's look up the levels plans for 2023 and I'm going to show you what I'm talking about here. 2023 to 2025, if we pull this up, look at the targets for we, we can even go for next year. But this is federal high skilled. Okay, this is basically the category aside from the PNPs they're looking for next year at 109,000 total landings. This isn't just for international students. And then if we go down to the PNPs, 110,000. So we have a grand total of 219,000 as the kind of the target for high skilled, which is skilled workers coming to Canada. So you guys do the math, right? Do the math. If we have um, 608,000 international students that submitted applications, this is not approvals, Okay, this is this is who've submitted applications and arguably maybe 50% of them will be rejected. But still, if you have the full year, it's arguable that there's probably going to be over a million applications. And maybe even if half of those are refused, you're still looking at 500,000 new people coming in. And by and large, most international students do want to stay. So I, yeah, this is the issue that we're dealing with. And, you know, the minister says he's not planning on instituting any caps. That would, That's fine. But you have to make a decision on on transitioning uh, international students on postgrad work permits to PR. Why no CECs? I wish you'd ask that. Canada, you you constantly have to renew your papers. There's a lot of yeah. um, you, know, you have to take the IELTS again and, and all these things. And um, their question is: since September 2021, there hasn't been a draw on the Thank CEC. You. Is Thank there you. an update on that? And also, is the ministry open to maybe 
forging another stream, another pathway that's more directly um, from international students to permanent residents. Yeah, and I think it's, and thank you. Uh, I, I think it's important okay, to I stress added that, that, applause that, myself. that being an international student or being a prospective international student isn't a, isn't a guarantee of permanent residence. Or okay. Oh, oh my goodness. That is the first time. Oh boy. Okay. I, I, I'll be honest, you guys. I, I'm just wondering right now. I am really, really wondering what is going on in the background. Oh my goodness. I'm like, what? Okay, right here. I wonder what this guy and this guy, what they're, the discussions they're having, having in the background. I'm very curious to see what these two fine fellows, the discussions that they had as Minister Fraser was on his way out and Minister Miller was coming in because Fraser extolled the virtues of international students that they were absolutely the, the critical component to our future economic programs and well-being in Canada. Now, about face, and remember, these are the same party. They're both liberal ministers. Now, Minister Miller has just said, there's no guarantee, right? You could come, but there's no guarantee. Oh, my goodness. Okay, let's see how he digs himself out of this one. This is, this is something. Or a guarantee of citizenship. Uh, unfortunately, part of the fraud is unscrupulous agents, both in Canada and outside Canada, entertaining yes. that false hope that if you can get into a program, you can become a Canadian citizenship. It, it, there have been, as you mentioned, and I'm sure you've covered this, there are limited pathways from permanent res to, to permanent residency. Um, I do recognize, and this is work that is currently ongoing, I, I don't have anything to announce to you today, uh, but this is work that is going on, particularly with, uh, with, with, with some of my stakeholders in the construction trades and other industries to make sure that we are not becoming even more addicted to temporary foreign workers with all, uh, all the realities that that has created in, in, a, in, a, in a country such as ours. Okay, what has happened? Well, we have over a million Ukraine nationals that have applied for open work permits. We have programs for Iran, open work permits. We have programs for Hong Kong, open work permits, and other countries. We have the H-1B open work permits, 10,000 there. Now, everyone who submits an application doesn't come to Canada, but all of those individuals are flooding into the country in ways that were not predicted at the time in which the annual levels, levels plans for permanent residents um, were, were set up. They never contemplated this. And the, the levels of international students then have been admitted. So there are massive amounts of people that are here in Canada on work permits. And the minister now is saying, hey, there's no guarantee. And, you know, it, it's, we have to recognize that there isn't going to be a pathway for, excuse me, for everyone. Well, I can tell you that in my discussions with, with this, uh, with, I'm flipping back between the, the ministers here, but in, in discussions and what we've heard from Minister Fraser, the former immigration minister, that kind of dialogue did not happen. So now, poor Minister Miller here, he is the fall guy. He is the guy that now is taking it on the chin. And in fairness, I don't think it's it's really entirely fair for him to have to, to take the brunt of this. But my goodness, uh, you know, Minister Fraser, he came in, made all these grandiose plans, and then out. And then shuffled to Minister Miller, and now poor Minister Miller is having to face the fire. But yeah, the, the reality is he's now basically saying, hey, some of you are just not going to make it. Well, my question is, then why the heck, if that's the case, did they give people so much false hope by extending these 18-month post-grad work permit um, policies? Why did they do that? Because basically then it's telling people, hey, um, keep your faint hope. And, and also people that fell out of status kept, you know, um, and, and, you know, their work permits expired. They would grandfather them in despite the regulations stating that 90-day restoration is all that's possible. You know, you could go back even in some cases, previous uh, policies, um, these PG, PGWP 18-month policies, people could get a new work permit even if they've been out of status for months and months and months. And so it's creating this huge, huge incentive um, and a reasonable belief on the part of everybody who's here on a post-grad work permit or one of these, you know, these um, subsequent in, uh, programs that there's going to be a pathway for permanent residence. And I think this is really disingenuous. I think this is really disingenuous. 
because people have made huge sacrifices and now you're telling them, well, too bad. Well, you created this. Depressed wages, uh, exploitation at times. Not to say that there aren't good actors, there are. Um, but what part of that part of that ecosystem, I know I keep using the word, is it, it, it does have that aspect of creating some very perverse incentives. And so what I'm looking perverse at- Perverse incentives, uh, quite, perverse incentives. Minister, you guys created those incentives. You absolutely created them by the 18 month post, post-grad extensions. If you had instead focused on like the one Filipino um, a reporter had indicated, um, a, a special program for these international students, you wouldn't need to do the extensions. Or at the very least, you could let people know if you don't qualify for permanent residence and your work permit's expiring, then you need to go home, which is fine as far as I'm concerned, as long as you let people know. But you, you created the incentive for people to stay. You created it. Oh boy, what a, what a nightmare. Frankly, is uh, a number of things that we could potentially announce over the next few months including increasing the points we attribute to skilled trades um, and, and, and opening more clearer paths to permanent residency for those people that are already here. Uh, and I don't have anything to announce today. There's still some work being done by my... Oh, yeah, there's lots of work being done, Minister. Once again, what is he hinting at? We don't want just any student that is here on a post-grad work permit. We don't just want the ones working at McDonald's or in, or in retail trade. We want trades people, not retail. We want trades people. We want people who <clears throat> are going to work in construction that are going to help to, to, um, you know, build these houses, this huge, huge, huge deficit of housing that we have. That's their main priority right now is trying to, to rectify that. And the irony of this whole situation. Okay. This is the irony. Okay. Is that minister Fraser right here, we'll pull him up. Minister Fraser, the former Minister of Immigration, was at the spearhead of many of these programs to allow so many temporary residents into Canada. And don't get me wrong, I, we are fully supportive of every single one of those initiatives. Within the firm, um, we've been heavily involved with pro bono initiatives for Ukraine, for Afghanistan, um, for, for Syria, all of those things. We're, it's, we're fully behind those things. But the problem... They never contemplated where these people were going to go. So Minister Fraser is now the minister responsible for dealing with the housing issue. So it's so ironic, I find, that some of the policies that he created, now he's having to try to figure out where, to, where, where people will live. And it's having a huge, huge impact all across the country. So, all right, this is, oh man, I feel, I, I honestly, you guys, I feel for, for Minister Miller. I really do. Because he's been left with a real crappy hand of cards. My team to make sure that we refine that. Um, but what I don't want to do is continue to entertain the atmosphere of uncertainty that a lot of pay people face, um, particularly people that have been fallen out of status and their skills are needed to be uh, in terms of, uh, of regularizing their status, but also perhaps providing a pathway to permanent residency. So there are a few ideas that are being toyed around. Recognize the value of, uh, of the statement you made as, as well as the people that are, that are looking to, come to become permanent residents. But I, I will stress that... Um, say it. It should not say be it. a foregone conclusion that if you're an international student... Thank you. And, and I would say not all international students want to become Canadian citizenship. That's their right. Um, but that say is it. sort of a, a line that's being used to try to attract people here and then often take their money and, and, and leave them um, in a very desperate situation. This is a clear, clear, like line in the sand that the minister has now drawn to reiterate once again that there is no guarantee that if you come study, spend hundreds of thousands of dollars and get a, um, a post-grad work permit, that there is going to be a pathway to permanent residence for you. And that, my friends, is why there's been no CEC. It's as simple as that. The minister is now clearly saying that, you know what? We don't want all of you guys. Thanks for coming, spending your money, hanging out here, working, but we don't want all of you. We only want the ones that we feel are going to be in the targeted industries where we're suffering the most shortage and where the most economic need exists. And where is that? He already said it, trades.
And we have an undocumented trades program for construction workers in Toronto. So I've got clients that are working through that program who are out of status, who are able to get work permits, regularize their status to continue forward um, with permanent residence, even though they've been out of status because they have construction skills. So that is what the minister's talking about. But he's got to be really careful here. But I, I'm grateful that he, once again, he's established, hey, there's no guarantees and no longer are we going to hold that out as a guarantee. So take note. Uh, at, the, at the center of this, we have to keep the students in question and a level of humanity at the federal government. So as I talk about programs, make sure we focus on those, um, those people that we are seeking to, to retain in this country. Did you hear that? They're going to focus on the people they are seeking to retain in this country. Those of you who are watching live, there's a, a nice group of people. We will absolutely go to a Q&A right after the minister's done because I want to hear from you guys what your thoughts are on this because this is groundbreaking. This is something that I didn't think the, that the Liberal government would actually uh, step forward and, and, and do, um, which is be unpopular. And every policy, the decisions that they made, um, you know, some of them have not been well-founded in terms of, uh, you know, uh, uh, forethought as to the ramifications in the future. They've been done to, to keep people happy and to please people, which trust me, I'm a people pleaser. I am. But now they're starting to face realities that you can't keep everybody happy and you are going to disappoint people. And their Minister Miller now is the face of, of a minister who's having, is, who's going to have to crack down. Thank you. Amazing. We're going to go to the line again. This is a phone call, when dial in. The system, please clearly state your name to register your question. It will be a brief pause for our participants to register for questions. Il y aura un court délai pour permettant de vous enregistrer dans la ligne d'attente pour la période des questions. Thank you for your patience. Merci de patienter. This and is we'll painful. Take the first question is from Rafi Bonjikanian, CBC News. Please go ahead. <coughs> oh, Rafi. Okay. What do you got, Rafi? Hi, thanks for that. Minister, I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit about the um, idea that universities uh, that set higher standard for services, support, and outcomes for international students will benefit. I I'm wondering, can you talk about what kinds of services would you um, expect them to extend? Uh, could that include uh, housing, for example? Yeah, thank Okay, so Rafi, uh, CBC, Rafi's a good guy. He does good work on the immigration front. He's talking about the recognized institutions programs and he says, I want details. Like, what does this look like? Like, what are the schools, these good schools, what kinds of things are they doing that are going to get them into these recognized inst institution programs where their study permits are fast tracked, where they're not grilled and, and, and going through the same, the, the same scrutiny, I guess, that other schools are because of the steps that they've put in place. So let's see what the minister has to say. Thank you, Rafi. You know, a number of the indicators that we are, will be finalizing as part of our launch in September for the recognized institution model include specific references to housing uh, and the servants the services that that uh, that institutions have to provide to be part of the recognized institution model some of them are already doing it uh, they can obviously do it better um, and others I think will be striving to to reach on, those goals uh, it isn't as you know every institution that automatically provides housing uh, adequate or inadequate so there'll be um, there'll be some institutions that automatically qualify just by the excellent work that they've been doing uh, and, and others that will be looking to enhance their services so that they can be part of this model that will entitle them to come to on what are, what are they minister um, what are the support services we could we could at another date provide you sort of a, a, a cursory list of what those indicators are uh, uh, okay this is classic classic I don't know. I'm, I seriously don't think that they have figured out what those support services are or what it looks like. Why in the world do you announce programs like this without having things sorted out? I just, I don't understand. That's why he can't answer. He knows housing's on the list because it's a huge, huge, huge 
public embarrassment for the government. Um, but why he's not announcing or explaining what the other services are, he should be able to say, these are the kinds of things. Obviously, he's hinted at support services for mental health. That's another thing that he's pointed to, but I don't understand why he doesn't just say it. Well, I know why, because it, they, they haven't figured it out yet. Once again, an announcement without the meat you know, on the bones, essentially. But they do revolve around what I was mentioning to one of your colleagues uh, who asked the question in person, which would be physical indicators of what services, uh, in terms of mental health services, yep. uh, student company journey services, the ratio that they have of, stu of, uh, of, ah. of foreign students to domestic students. Brilliant, brilliant. So once again, the private schools who are 100% international, uh, you know, international students and no domestic Canadians or permanent residents, they're not going to be part of this program. So there's going to be a ratio. If you have, if you have a, a ratio, and who knows what it is, but that, that's really, really interesting. Okay, makes sense. As well as housing needs uh, that, 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 are, that are supported. So um, that'll, be, that'll be really Im important as we move along and when we look at the uptake and finalization of the model. I think as the federal government, See, what we were loath to do was to come out it. with a set of hard and fast uh, indicators with ratios that we hadn't properly vetted and, and then uh, have some consequences that were totally unintended. So there's... Well, the in unintended consequences you guys at the minister talking about, if they, if they were to institute a ratio, it's pretty clear. If, if schools are relying on 60% international tuition to meet their budgets, and the minister says, well, we're, we want to see a ratio of this many international students to, to Canadians. Maybe, maybe one, one in four of your student body are international students, not nine out of ten. That could be the difference in ratio. But imagine if international students, and I don't know the figures, like we always throw out about three times the tuition that, an inter, that, a, that a domestic a Canadian or permanent resident would have to pay. Um, international students pay three times that. Well, that's huge revenue for these schools. So they have to be very, very careful. But remember, this recognized institutions program, uh, you know, recognizing the schools that they're going to just give more favor to, that are going to see less scrutiny of people coming to study at those schools where, you know, they're going to fast track and expedite the issuance of the study permits. Those special benefits that they're going to give these schools if they meet these certain criteria it doesn't necessarily mean that other schools can't still go through the program. It's just their students might take a whole lot longer to get their study permits. So th that's what we're talking about here. I don't think the minister talking about, you know, this recognized institutions is only going to include, um, you know, it's going to be the only pathway for, for schools. That would completely, the, the ramifications would be massive across the country because the industry is so, so massive. So, and stakeholders, well, the international schools are stakeholders and they're voters right? And they do not want to alienate their, their, their voting base. All that to say is, Rafi, is we still have some work to do in finalizing it. Yeah, but the indicators do. that I mentioned, and there's about eight or 10, deal with uh, essentially how, how, how institutions treat uh, their students and the indicators that, that do underpin that conclusion. We'll ask, obviously ask those, those institutions to provide support. Uh, we, we know now that we have to have a trust but verify model, um, but it's very much one that'll be... Um, that'll be finalized in the coming months. Coming months. Oh, I hate that. Does that mean like June of next year? Much one that'll be, uh... Thanks. And um, just as a follow-up, if you can just look ahead to next week, um, I know your immigration levels plan is due soon. Are you shutting out yeah. any possibility of reducing your immigration target? And I'll ask you to answer that in English and French as well, please, for all you can. Uh, Uh -huh. Je répondrai en français d'abord. Euh, de un, si les gens ont bien écouté l'annonce aujourd'hui, on, on, a, on a besoin euh, d'immigrants au pays pour, euh, si on veut remplir tous les, tous les ambitions qu'on a en, en matière de logement, de matière de construction, d'infrastructure pour, euh, pour l'avenir. Euh, je ne reviendrai pas au phénomène de dénatalité, puis... La, la courbe des voies euh, n'est pas très bonne au Canada. Évidemment, le, la population qui doit se rajeunir, l'immigration euh, est une porte d'entrée et une piste de solution à cette fin. Euh, dans le contexte, euh, je l'ai dit publiquement, j'avais beaucoup de difficultés à Just voir. Just so you guys know, this is what we're about. Euh, Do they plan on increasing or decrease these levels? Dans cette optique, il y a des ajustements. 
Euh, selon moi, oui. Euh, Devrait-on stabiliser? On regarde ça présentement. Je vous dirais, Rafi, la, la décision, je sais qu'elle approche le 1er novembre, mais elle n'est pas encore entièrement arrêtée. Il y a des discussions au plus haut niveau qui se poursuivent. Euh, donc, euh, ça pour dire que vous Good allez luck devoir all of this in le 1er novembre pour avoir une réponse finale. Uh, Rafi, as I said in French, uh, a final decision has not been taken. There are still not. discussions at the highest levels being undertaken. I, I think Cabinet. people are very well aware of uh, two phenomena. But one, the, uh, the importance of immigration in increasing our gross domestic product. This is one of the most significant economic vehicles to our country, but we need to yes, do it, it in a responsible way. Yes, uh, you do. That entrance into the workforce uh, is 90 plus percent driven by immigration. So any conversation about reducing needs to uh, needs to entertain the reality that that would be a, a hit to our economy. Uh, I've said previously that I don't see a scenario in which uh, in, in which we reduce. But within that context, do we look at uh, the categories that we use uh, to uh, make sure that we are the vital country, vital country that we are, uh, as well as a humanitarian and open country for people mm -hmm. fleeing war? So just, I'm going to stop there again. I'm going to show you this. They have a target for 2023 of 465,000. This is overall immigrants that they want to bring into Canada. And I'm being very generalized about this, but I'm not going to get into the specifics, but this is the basis of it. For next year, 485. And so what Ravi's asking is, are you going to reduce this number given the fact there isn't housing enough for everybody? And the minister says, well, we need new immigrants because they're the net increasers on our um, w within our labor force. They're the ones that are going to help to drive the economy going into the future, and that's fine. But what the minister is neglecting to, um, to, to acknowledge is in our labor force right now are all of the individuals that are coming in on open work permits that are not a part of this, right? That are, that are temporary workers that are filling temporary needs who are hoping to become one of these. And so the minister said, we need to figure out how we're going to sp spread out this pie. So we've got the federal high skilled, which is, which is federal skilled worker, CEC, and the federal skilled trade program. You guys will remember this one right here is the tier to pier pathway, which will wrap up this year. So you can see where are these numbers going? Add them up. 82 and 25 is about 107, just about 108. Where is that right here? All they're doing is taking these and essentially putting it right here. So these come to an end and they're putting them there. And then in other areas, the number, the increase is, so they're not actually increasing the federal high skilled, CEC, FSW, any. But when you look to the federal business, you can see they're increasing these other programs like agri-food. We've got clients with agri-food, with RNIP, the uh, Economic Mobility Pathways Project, which is to help uh, transition uh, refugees through economic programs versus um, the, the traditional refugee model. And then if you look down here, Atlantic immigration is getting a bump. And the PNPs are getting a bump of just a little bit. It's not much, you guys. If you look at this, we're looking at about 4,500 more, okay? So this is, this is what we're looking at right now. And this is what Ravi was asking. And the minister is saying, okay, well, what could they do? Like there's a certain number, if we go down here to refugees, look at this. They have actually indicated total refugees of 76,000 here. So does that mean that they're going to reduce those and they're going to maybe add those to the, to the economic? Does it mean that the the family they're going to put caps on you know on on parents and grandparents or reduce this to add more space up here for the 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 federal high skill? These are the discussions that they that they have to have, and there's no way he can answer that none. But it's it's going to be difficult. Is there space within there to look at and 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 revise some of those numbers in different categories? Uh, and, yes, and perhaps be a little more innovative and fine tuned as we uh, as we move from. <laughs> matching less hope with demand, but actually supply with demand. Uh, and that is Oh my goodness. Okay. This is like the old concept of shuffling chairs on the Titanic, really. Um, you know, what they're talking about is taking robbing from one category to create space for another. Um, but yeah, this is, and, and I want to point out something as well, you know, because people that come on open work permits, 
they now have to realize very clearly that this government has no intention of transitioning everyone here that's on a work permit to permanent residence, full stop. So when you're going through this process and you're trying to figure out what you're going to do with yourselves and maybe we'll listen to the minister, we'll let it change and then we'll get to questions because I want to get to your questions. So hang on and we will get to that in just a little bit. All right, let's let's just listen to the to the rest of what the minister has to say, the other questions, and then we're going to jump in and we're going to answer your questions and let's talk about it because I'm curious what your guys' thoughts are on this because I would be pissed. I would be There's, really upset. Um, sort of a, a broad brushstroke uh, to say finally that uh, as the decision hasn't been taken, you'll have to wait for the 1st of November, but um, it doesn't mean that I'm holding a secret back on you. It, I, the, discus the discussions are actually still ongoing, but those are some of the... The public reflections that I November can we'll get the new time. levels plans. We'll find out, and I'll be the okay, first to let you know. Very close to our 11:30 end time. Our last question will be over here from the floor. Okay, last question. Hello, Minister. This is Tarun Deep Singh from PTC Punjabi. Uh, there is a petition already available on the page of House of Commons, which is E4454, and already have nearly 16,000 signatures. That too in just one week on it. Uh, which is about providing five years of work permit to those who study for two years in Canada and two years of work permit to those who are uh, who study for one year in Canada. So how long uh, will Government of Canada will take to implement it? And uh, if not, what are the plans to accommodate these international students in the country? As data shared by StatCan shows that there are currently 1.94 million international students uh, in the country. Okay, this is... This is very, very interesting. Great question to wrap up on. Essentially, there's a, um, I think it must be a private member's bill that's been put forward or a petition. I can't remember exactly what it, what, what, what it is or what stage it's at. Um, actually, it's not that I can't remember. This is the first that I'm hearing about it. So I suspect what it is, well, you heard from the individual there. What they want to do is they want to expand. So if you go to school for two years, you can get a five-year post-grad work permit. Guys, I'll be honest, I don't think that's the answer. All you're doing is kicking that can farther down the road. It's the same thing as the 18 month. And when it comes to the, the, the programs, what do we want as a country? Um, you know, do we want the only people to be able to qualify for permanent rents, those that have gone to school in Canada, um, those that are able to get work permits? Maybe that's the direction we go. I don't know. Or do we want to continue to bring people in as permanent residents from abroad? That's really what this comes down to. And Excuse me, they're also talking about proposal if you go study for one year that you can get a two-year post-grad. And I'll be honest, I kind of am, am more online with that because one year of a post-grad is just never going to be enough to get permanent residence. Let's see what the minister has to say. Um, I, I guess the ultimate question, uh, the, the initial question really is whether we, um, whether we, whether we agree with the petition. And, and that's something mm -hmm. that is, I think is still something we would have to revise. Yep. Uh, it's just a petition a then. Progress. So, um, I can't promise you today that I will commit to that. What I have committed to is to look at the postgraduate work permit and, and revamp it. hasn't been looked at in 10 years. So that's part of the work that we have announced sort of cautiously today, uh, and that will be work that's ongoing. Uh, the, the discussions that I'm having with, uh, with, with trades, uh, with, Once again, with, with trades. unions, with, uh, with industry, are ones trades, that really trades. much revolve around the, the labor shortage and the specific trades that need to be filled in this country if we're going to be the ambitious country that we stand in front of podiums and talk about. So do you hear this? Once again, trades, 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 which by and large are none of the post-grad work permit holders. So understand this is where the government is now focusing. They're, they have to do that to, to try to build houses and make room for all these people that they're bringing into Canada, something they had not turned their mind to when they opened up basically the the the, the wide sweeping no caps to uh, to the various uh, programs that they've, you know, temporary programs for work permits. Uh, so I think there's a ton of options on the table. Whether the solution proposed in the petition is, is, is the one that, uh, that I would favor is not, um, is not something I could speak about today. But in other words, no, he doesn't favor that. Certainly understand the needs in this country. Okay, that's there all the time that we have today. Thank you so much for tuning in. There we go, you guys. Thank you. Well, that was fun. Oh, there we go. All right. There we go. Woo. Well, there was a ton, ton, and I, you know, that we covered here. And um, I hope that was beneficial, but I want to hear what you guys have to say. So what I'm going to do is I'm opening it up. Anyone who has questions, you can post those questions now, and we will talk about this.
Okay. All right. So uh, let's just drop this off here. Our my little uh, my little intro screen here, and I'm now. Let's jump in and let's let's take a look at your questions. Any questions that you guys have, you can start to post them now. All right. Let's see. Um, <laughs> I Wasim says Canada is the best country. I'm going to expand this up here so that it covers our whole screen here. That should be good. Canada is the best country in terms of immigration as well as benefits. It has the potential. Uh, Talia says, I share the frustration. Yes, all of you who are international students studying in Canada who've been sold this promise that you have a permanent resident pathway, understand this is very clear from the minister that you may not. Only those that fit into the industries that they want, only those that rank the highest are going to have those opportunities. And so there is no guarantee, okay? Uh, VJ says, what about work permit for a good uh, private college? Well, like you said, they're going to have a trusted program, but schools, colleges, where the vast majority of students are international and not domestic, I think those colleges are are in a, a, a serious host of problems because they are the ones that are being targeted. Okay. Um, okay. Sam says, in the Q&A, Minister clarified that being an international student is not a guaranteed pathway to PR. That is absolutely the case. So I urge all current prospective students to do extensive research and take a decision accordingly. Well, absolutely, Sam. No longer do you make decisions purely based on um, coming to school. And remember, many, many people look at studying as a pathway to permanent residence when they can't score high enough for express entry. So you, those of you who are thinking you're going to go do that, go to a one-year program and then hopefully benefit for some amnesty for international, you know, graduates, you know, another 18-month post-grad, I do not believe we are going to see another 18-month post-grad extension. I don't believe it. I think what's going to happen now is that they're going to let people just, you know, their their temporary um, time expire. And if they don't qualify for permanent residence, they have to go home. That's what they want to happen. Why? Because there are far too many international students and post-grad work permit holders in Canada taking up housing that um, is, is, you know, that could be used for, for other people like Canadians and permanent residents who can't find a place to live. Now, they never said that, um, but I can guarantee that is why they're now in a situation where they're saying, hey, there's no guarantees. Okay, uh, Christopher says, what about max working hours for students? This policy is expiring from 15th of November, 2022 to the 31st of December, 2023. International students will be able to work an unlimited number of hours off campus. I hated that, Christopher. I hated that when it was announced. It is really hard to do good in school and work full-time at the same time. And the success, one of the main, really significant predictors of success after you graduate, getting those good jobs is getting good grades. And if your grades are such that, you know, that, that you're just skating by, and I have consults all the time with people who flunk out of school because they simply, they were working too many hours and they didn't have time to put into school. And then their whole dream unravels. So no, I, I thought that was a bad policy right from the beginning. If you're here to study, you should be studying, not working. Okay. Um, <laughs> Roop Deep says, hey, just join. What's happening? Is there a CAC draw coming? I seriously doubt there's going to be a CEC draw coming anytime soon that's going to specifically target students in Canada. Okay. All right. Wagner says, with postgrad extensions, people could have more chances to increase express entry points, fitting into a provincial program or even digging a job offer. No? Well, you're right, Wagner. But the problem, and this is what we've talked about before, is that there's only so much room. There isn't an unlimited number of people they can bring in. For next year, 2024, right here, you can see the, the, the federal high skilled is only 109,020. And then if we go down here to the PNP, it's 110,000. So that's like we talked about, 219,020 is the target for skilled, you know, um, and, and provincial nominee programs, some of them even include low skill positions within their quotas, within their programs. So what you have to understand is that, that there is no room. So dragging it out further, um, the government right now is saying, look, there's no guarantees for you international students. You were coming here temporarily. If someone's told you something different, understand that when your, your work permit expires, if you're not yet eligible for permanent residence because there isn't a program for you, especially in Ontario, where 49% of all students have gone 
historically over the most recent um, statistics that they've taken. Um, they're basically saying, well, you just have to go home. It's a temporary program. So, and you're right, Igor says, students don't fly to Canada for a four-year program and then seek employment in trades. Absolutely, they do not. Okay, Vincenti, uh, Vincenti says, I think students need to realize that the new reality is that they are not going to be any CEC draws and this government is not making every international student PR as it's not guaranteed simple fact. I agree. I agree. I agree. Um, yeah, Ying Cheng says, how do you prove that you have intention to stay anyways? Well, that's a good question. Um, Nestor, there's nothing wrong with trades. Of course not. But understand People who go to university do not go to university to then go and work in trades. They don't, Nestor. That's not what Igor was saying. I see many people coming to Canada for trades occupation training. Yes, that might be the case. But the pathways to those trades are not, to permanent residents, are not as clear, okay? Sure, you come, do training on work permits, work permits, Nestor. But when it comes to permanent residents, that's where things fall off the, the rails. And the pathways for trades to become permanently and stay permanently in Canada that's the problem. All right. Salar, good to see you. Okay, Anastasia, hey, how are you doing? Hi, Mark, joined just now. Seems that French is our only hope to get enough points to go through express entry. You are in Alberta, my friend. Remember, when you complete your program, you get a job in a related field, you have the opportunity to go through the Alberta Opportunity Stream outside of express entry. So yes, absolutely, French for express entry is a... Is Ironically, I'm going to be flying to uh, I'm going to be flying to Quebec here in about a week and a half uh, to present to the Quebec Immigration uh, Lawyer Association on pathways uh, for francophone speakers outside of the province of Quebec. And absolutely, it's never been better if you speak French. But for everyone else, it's never been worse. Okay, let's see. Rosie's got a great a great uh, response here. Then they should only approve study permits whose programs belong to those in category based in express entry or PNPs and not cash in money from those who are taking not in demand occupations once graduated. That is what the minister was hinting at, right? That's what he was hinting at. Okay, Vincenti says, I think the important revision of postgrad will be something like you said. Only those students needed will be issued postgrads or something similar to this. Well, they're going to make it a lot more um, targeted as much as possible. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> okay. Okay, Mr. Mimi Bear says, will they increase the postgrad one year to two to three years? Just asking. Seriously doubt it. You saw the question with that petition, and it was a petition. So all it was was someone started the petition it's got 18,000 signatures on it to expand the postgrad, but that is not the direction the liberal government is going. It is not. Um, you can very clearly see that their solution to this is for international students who are working on postgrads that don't have pathways to permanent residence. They want you to leave. It's as simple as that. That is the writing on the wall. They want you to leave so that you'll free up housing and in the short term um, help to deal with this housing crisis that Canada has. That's what's happening. Okay, Lillian says, what is the fate of international students studying in Canada right now? Well, your fate is you're a temporary resident here. And understand, this is the messaging that, that I got from Minister Miller right here. And I'm going to pull him up because the reality is Minister Miller just gave this announcement. So here he is right here. So the fate, the fate that we have here uh, Lillian, is, is that the minister says there's no guarantee that you, as an international student, will have a pathway to permanent residence. So you need to be prepared that when your study is completed, whatever work permits you get, that at the end of that work, if you choose to stay, there is no guarantee you will get permanent residence and you need to prepare to go home. It's as simple as that. Um, okay, Abdella says, "What's the uh, good afternoon, guys. What's the news? Some of you are turning in, so let's just do a quick little high level of what the minister's announcement was for international students. One, he identified <clears throat> the desire to combat fraud within the international student program has resulted in them looking to do things like enhanced verification of admission letters for schools. So that's the first thing. The second thing, they're setting up what they describe as a recognized institution program to try to sort out the schools that are really good 
the ones that are keeping the quality of education high, that are doing things right, that are supporting students and giving them special treatment for faster processing of study permits for, I think, more easily approval, the approval of study permits even. Um, and I think they're going to use artificial intelligence to process those applications uh, to, to get them through quicker. Um, and then schools that are just not doing things right, that are maybe study permit mills. The only purpose of the school's existence is to, is to sell study permits to international students. Um, I think they're going to really crack down on them. They're going to put lots of pressure on the provinces to reevaluate the DLI list. And so, yeah, that, those are some of the main things that are going to happen. They talked about the 11, they had uh, 1,150 <clears throat> potential, <clears throat> excuse me, that they were aware of um, study permits uh, that were applied for with fraudulent letters. The minister talked about 400. Um, they were able to capture uh, well, 400 of them, they weren't able to identify at the at the onset and refuse that got through. And this formed that, uh, you know, that task force on trying to sort out the 285 students that had received refusals or, or had been asked to leave. They identified that there were 63 students that were genuine, that they helped to transition to other temporary resident, that there were, I think, 40 or so that for sure they felt the students were fully complicit in the fraud. And so they are taking steps to try to combat that through those measures. And another thing the minister talked about was revamping the postgrad work permit program. And these are all things they're looking at. And next month, they're going to be revising and updating this right here, which is the annual levels plan. So this will change to 2024 to 2026. And, um, and so you can see this was issued November 1st, 2022. We will be seeing a new levels plan for next year. So will the numbers go up? Will the overall target go up or like to, to, to 485 like they've indicated here? Or will they go, will it go higher? Will it stay the same what they project? And then federal high skilled, how are all of these different um, programs, how are they going to, how is this pie going to be uh, split up? That's the question. All right, we'll pull off Minister Miller. <clears throat> okay, so let's jump back here. Now, once again, um, that's just a quick little overview for those that are jumping in uh, late and wondering what's going on. Okay, and I'm going to try to answer as many questions as I can. So let's see what's next here. Um, <clears throat> great question. The B says, any idea about STEM? You know, the, the category-based draws. Will they be done? I'm bilingual with the CRS score 470. Do you think I stand any chance or should I consider study? See, once again, after this announcement, the B, I can tell you, unless you truly plan on studying in Canada and returning home after you study, or you intend to, to study in areas where Canada has skill shortages, which theoretically could be STEM, although there's a reason they haven't been issuing STEM draws, because they are getting STEM category individuals through the regular no program specified. And this is something I also want to share with you guys here. I'm going to go to the rounds of invitations and I'm going to explain something which I think people are overlooking. So when you when you look at the, the way they've structured this, okay, we'll just leave it like that. When you look at the category-based draws right here, see that they're introducing, there, there are essentially three types of categories that they do rounds of invitations. So one is the general round, which is the no program specified. Two is the program specified rounds like CEC or FSW or PNP. And then the third is the new category based rounds of invitations. Well, one of the things we've talked about is that they have a desire to ensure that when they do invitations, that there is a, uh, a certain percentage of those individuals are going to be within STEM and it's a fairly high amount. And I can't remember, I think Alicia had, she had, she'd kept notes for me and Let's see, what do we have on her little list here? I wonder if I can pull it up. This is kind of, this is funny. This is when we were, Alicia and I took, we attended a, um, a, a, um, a basically a training meeting with IRCC on the new category based draws. And I'll just pull this up so you guys can see it. This is the notes that Alicia took in terms of the breakdowns of, of really how many individuals or what percentage of overall immigration they wanted to see falling into these categories. So you can see for Francophone, 11 to 15% is the target. Health, 9 to 12. STEM, 28 to 31, which is the highest, okay? Um, trades, 3 to 4%. Transport, 1 to 2. And Ag, 1 to 2. 
So that's essentially the breakdown that they had told us. Now, what that means is it's not that of the category-based draws that they do, and let's go to the previous rounds and take a look at it. It's not that the category-based draws that they're going to do are going to be, you know, that that uh, of the category-based draws, they're going to issue, um, what did we say there? Uh, it was, just give me one second to pull this back up. If I can find it again here. Uh, oh, I don't have it on here. Okay, let's flip back. It's not that right here there okay it's not that they mean of all the category based draws 28 to 31 percent of the category based draws are going to be stem that's not what they're getting at and and for a, for a while that's what i thought they were they were shooting for but then as alicia and i talked she said no i think what they mean is that when when they do rounds of invitations collectively all of these whether it's whether it's the no program specified draws or even the provincial nominee programs um, like we've just saw right here, there was a PNP that was done earlier this week um, that collectively within this, as well as if we jump down here to STEM, that with amongst all of these, that they want to ensure that the actual number of, um, of, of STEM applicants fits within those categories. So the 28 to 31%, if they, they can hit it using any of those three options. So... Is there going to be a STEM? Well, maybe the reason we're not seeing STEM is because STEMs rank so high right now that they're meeting their, their threshold, that, that ratio that they're looking for. So, yeah. So we'll, we'll, we'll uh, yeah. All right. Um, let's keep zipping through here. Igor just shared. Okay. Okay, I'm going to flip this over. This just came hot off the press. You guys are seeing it right off the bat. So changes to the International Student Program aimed to protect students. So this news release right here, you can pull it up. It's, it's on the government's newsroom. This is a, a news release. So here's what we've got here. Let's, let's break this down. This is the specific information. There's not a lot, but this breaks down exactly what the minister was talking about. Okay. So yes, Canada is a top destination for students. High education quality. This is the thing that's being compromised because of some of the the the... He, he called them kind of fly-by-night schools. Um, welcoming, diverse society, opportunities to work and or immigrate permanently after graduation. Yes. And then students have contributed to life on campuses. They have also experienced some serious challenges. That's great. So Minister Miller today announces plans to implement several measures aimed at strengthening Canada's international student program and at better protecting genuine students from fraud. So once again, protecting genuine students. If you are not a genuine student, they will seek to remove you as quickly as they can, which rightly so. Um, it's the bad ones that spoil it for the good ones. Starting December the 1st, so this is when it's going to kick in, post-secondary DLIs will be required to confirm every applicant's letter of acceptance directly with IRCC. So this is to avoid what happened with those international uh, students who were who were who were defrauded by fake uh, admissions letters and IRCC didn't catch it when they applied. So this new enhanced verification process aims to protect the students from fraud, from LOA fraud, and help them avoid similar problems that some students faced earlier this year. Okay. Um, in time, do you see this? In time for the fall 2024 semester. Okay. So basically what it means is he said in the coming months, it could be anywhere into next year, 2024, but before the fall semester, September 2024, which is almost a year away, IRCC will adopt a recognized institution framework to benefit post-secondary DLIs that set a higher standard for services, support, and outcomes for students. What are the outcomes? You know, just one of the things they emphasized was places to live, right? But also the quality. And then the DLIs will benefit, for example, from priority processing for students who plan to attend their schools. So another, you know, incentive. So once again, they're using a carrot instead of a stick, a stick to incentivize schools to clean up their acts. And in the coming months, IRCC will complete an assessment of the postgrad program and introduce reforms to better calibrate it to meet the needs of Canadian labor. Oh my goodness. So does that mean that postgrads are really going to be um, you know, restricted to, to certain types of occupations. I don't think that's the case, but what does that mean? You know, and then once again, as well as regional and Francophone immigration goals. So each province will have a say potentially 
in the, the post-grad work permits that are being issued to individuals to stay. So who knows? This We'll talk about this in future days, but this could be huge. Um, and then once again, they're like, please, please forgive us for being mean. We know that some of you won't like us anymore because we're having to be stern and we want everybody to be happy and please everybody, but we can't do that anymore. That's really what this means. They recognize the social, cultural, economic benefits of international students and those benefits to continue. We want them. And we must address, however, challenges in the integrity of the system. And they're taking actions against nefarious actors who have preyed on genuine students for financial gain. And this is not just education agents, uh, immigration consultants or lawyers, heaven forbid. Um, it's, it's also schools, right, that have popped up that exploit. And, um, you know, to identify the fraudulent letters and uh, institutions that demonstrate strong support for students will be given basically um, a, a, a faster process, front and line opportunities. And um, yeah, and uh, it marks the initial changes identified through the review. And this is the important part in 2021, the review of the international student program, as well as broader engagement initiatives and immigration system for Canada's future and ongoing work with institutions, provinces, and uh, yeah, just to better detect fraud and uphold the integrity of the immigration programs because they're being, you know, really crushed. So there you go. So as far as quick facts, this is actually quite interesting and I want to share this with you guys so that those of you who are looking to come to Canada and study understand the situation. International education accounts for $22 billion in economic activity annually. I would say that fraudulent, fraudulent transactions, the seedy part of this process, I have to assume that it accounts for three times that, $60 billion maybe. With, with people looking to, to try to find pathways and, and uh, you know, maybe that's a little bit crazy, but, but understand this is just the legitimate, you know, the legitimate market. Um, it's greater than Canada's exports of auto, lumber, or aircraft, and supports more than 200,000 jobs in Canada. So if they crack down, understand some of these private schools that are going to be hardest hit, understand, you guys, that there will be Canadians working in the schools that will be losing jobs. Um, the temporary drop in international students in 2020 resulted in a loss of more than $7 billion just because of the, the pandemic. So once again, they see this as a money-making proposition for the, for the country in terms of dollars. But as well, they still see it as um, a pillar in our economic recovery. Okay, um, in Canada, ministries of education in 10 provinces and territories... And this, once again, they're saying, hey, it's not just us, you guys. It's the provinces are responsible for the organization delivery and assessment of education. So don't blame us for crappy schools. It's the provinces that, that accredit them. And then they talk about, and here's the task force. You guys can review this about the reforms. So in June, following investigations into fraudulent mission letters, an IRCC task force was formed. So we can open it up and we can see. It's basically the minister. It doesn't give much detail. It just talks about the task force that they've created it, okay, to look into this these issues. So don't get your hopes up that there's anything being released yet. It's not. So they're to work with CBSA to review the cases of the effective students. And the goal of this work was to prevent genuine students from facing removal. Why? Because there was a huge uproar. They would have been happy just to have all the students go home. But there was a huge uproar. And, you know, it becomes a public embarrassment. And public policy for immigration is driven largely by public shaming uh, in the media. So 103 cases reviewed, 63 were found to be genuine and 40 were not. So they've only reviewed 103 of the cases so far. It's ongoing. So you can see that there's about 40% were complicit with the fraud. And they said 63 were genuine, which they've helped with pathways forward. And the 40 are basically you know, hit the road essentially is the, is the expectation, which I think all of us want that. The genuine students impacted uh, by fraud task force is aware of additional cases that have not yet been reviewed as individuals are still awaiting decisions. Um, and if an exclusion order is issued in these cases, the cases may be reviewed by the task force in the future. So, and then they announce here, uh, they, the, the charges laid against this individual for the immigration related offenses. And he was identified by victims as one of the central figures involved in this, the fraud. Clearly, there were others involved. And they'll continue to work with the CBSA to identify unscrupulous actors. So 
just thanks, Igor, for sharing that. I appreciate it. So that's the, the, the recent kind of overview and announcements. Okay. All right. Let's go to a few more and then we're going to, then uh, let's see if we can get some more questions. Um, okay. This is a great question, uh, Vibob. I'm going to answer this one. I know you, you run out of space here, but are business skill people really welcome in Canada, given the fact that companies prefer a Canadian born for these roles naturally because their communication skills are on a higher level? Yes. So obviously every country to function, you need to be able to speak English well or in whatever country. Germans, if I don't speak any German and I go there and want to get a job, well, I'm going to be working survival jobs because I don't speak German. And that's the reality for every country. But I can assure you, that Canadian employers are well, well aware of the value of international workers who come, who are dedicated, who are committed. And I love, love my, my, um, my international employees who've come and, and, uh, and worked. I've got individuals working for me on work permits. I have individuals that have come in and obtained permanent residence are now employed with my, with my firm. Um, and they are hardworking, dedicated, awesome, awesome employees. I just love them. And many, many employers feel the exact same way they do. So ultimately, though, English and being able to communicate is a huge, huge factor. Okay. We'll keep doing here. Um, okay. Lillian says, what types of trades are they looking at? Is it only on construction? Well, construction is one of them. But there's a need when you're building houses for electricians, for plumbers, for roofers, right? For framers, a whole bunch of different things. So all of those trades are, 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 you know, related to, you know, construction are, are a part of it. Okay. Uh, Mookie, good to see you connecting in from Dubai. Well, Nestor, there's no mystery about this. Essentially with STEM, the, the reality is they're getting enough people through the no program specified draw. And so, um, yeah, so Nestor, understand, once again, based on the targeted category ranges disclosed by your channel, we should have 15K stems before the end of 2023. No, so we're only seeing. So this is where I've clarified that, Nestor. We're seeing uh, only 500. Um, so this is the reality. They are encompassing all of them within those targets. Okay. Um, okay, ODFC says, thanks for your video. Can I make a study permit? application here in Canada while on a visitor visa. Um, you, you can submit an application online, but your study permit has to be issued from outside of Canada. All right. Um, Mirko says, will they extend the full-time policy? I don't think so. I really don't. I really don't. And Adam says, uh, is it likely the scores will ever drop below 500? Well, we'll just have to see. Um, we know that if they do larger draws, and if we go back to the actual uh, rounds of invitations, let's see if I can pull this up right here. If we go to the rounds of invitations and you look historically, um, the, the no program specified draws right here, when they do larger draws right here, 4,300, it did dip below 500. But, you know, it's really super, super competitive. Okay, let's see what else we have here. And I'm curious of what your thoughts are. So, um so Amar Preet says, I think they should put a quota limit on student visas. The process should be more stringent than it is right now. And that's, that's a possibility. That's a possibility. Peter says, it sounds really disappointing. Wish they would have said this five years ago, said I wouldn't have gave Canada the best part of my work life. I agree. I agree. People will have to make those decisions going forward now. In the past, because of express entry, you know, everyone would say, go study in Canada and then you can have a pathway to permanent residence. But I've repeatedly told people that you have to be strategic with it. It's everything you have to. And this is something that I talked about with my top six, you know, um, takeaways from from the, the minister's announcement last year on transitioning from TR to PR. You have to be strategic. You can't just race off to a school in Ontario because the number of spots are very limited. You know, and I think I'm going to do a video targeting students once again who are looking to study in Canada to, to, to just be very, very uh, smart about where you're going. Um, you have to look to make sure that there is a pathway if that's what you want to do. Atlanta, Canada has multiple programs. Alberta, uh, you know, Saskatchewan, Manitoba have programs that, that facilitate in certain circumstances, postgrads to getting, um, when they're working in the province, to, to getting pathways to permanent residence that are outside of express entry. 
But yeah, I, I get it. Yep, Abdella, they are absolutely doing that with Chinook in terms of the AI processing. Uh, they're just now being more transparent about it. Okay, Jala says, is it true that graduates of Eastern Colleges in Newfoundland and Labrador get PR as soon as they complete their programs without one-year job experience? An agency told me this. We will cover this. I'm not going to get into the specific program requirements because we've been on quite a while for this and I want to make sure that people were focused on this specific topic. But this is stuff that you guys need to look at and you can. You go in, you look at the provinces, you look at the requirements uh, for specifically for, for, for um, postgraduate students, international student programs, and you'll be able to see for yourself. Ultimately, anyone who has questions about provinces and options and transitioning from permanent residence, uh, so, so from international student status to, to pathways to permanent residence, um, you can book a consult with our firm. All you have to do is just slide over and uh, I don't know if I have a link in the, in, in the description here of this video, but you can look at any previous videos. We always have links. Go to Whole Immigration Law and just click on speak to a lawyer and you can book a consultation and, um, and we'd be delighted to, to walk through and give you a strategy long before you ever think about studying in Canada. All right, let's see what else is next here. And anyone who's asking specific questions about whether or not I qualify, I just, I'll just reiterate, I, I, I ring, um, but basically what I do here is I just ring my little triangle here and then I direct you to book a consult and we can talk about your specific situations. Okay, let's see what else is next here. <laughs> Spider-Man, good to see you from YUL. Good to see you. Okay, and Manish, especially like yours, your questions, um, book a consult and we can talk about eligibility for you. Okay, um, and, and just to clarify, I hope you guys understand this now, Joe and Nestor, that the, the totals now, the breakdowns, originally when we had that meeting with IRCC, I interpreted that to mean that that was the percentage of total STEM draws that they would be issuing and how they would be allocating it. But no, it looks to me like what they're doing is that's the overall percentage of, of, of ITAs granted through any of the program are into those categories. So what that means is STEM individuals are taking up a large portion of the programs, um, the no program specified draws or the PNPs as, it's, as it is, so they're not needing to do STEM draws to lift the, the, the percentages up to where the totals that they want to have them in. So that's really what's happening. Uh, Tala says, do you think that these changes will help the housing problems? Thanks. Well, think about it this way. Um, think about it this way. Um, there are, the, the housing crisis is a product of two simple things. Um, many, many people looking for places to live and too few places for them to, to live in. And so if you have hundreds of thousands of international students on post-grad work permits here that are extending through the 18-month post-grad uh, policies and are still here and still don't have a pathway to permanent residence, if the government says, well, you don't have one, you have to go home, guess what's going to happen? Vacancies. And so they haven't said that, and it's cruel and heartless as far as I'm concerned because they've, they've held out certain things and, and, you know, and many international students on postgrad work permits have relied upon them to choose to stick around and tough things out. Well, I think, will it change if they truly you know, um, are, are, are not extending 18-month work permit extensions? There, two things are going to happen. People are going to go home or people are going to go underground. And, they've, you know, and, and they already have. So... Yeah, that's my, that's my view on that. Okay, uh, Mimi Bear says, one factor to have PR is to work in your related program. I agree, yes. So in Alberta, that's the case. You, if, you, if you have a job in a related field um, of study, then you can go through the Alberta Opportunity Stream. So like, for example, nursing students here must work in hospitals. Yes, that's all factor. Um, it's hard though sometimes when there's more students graduating in certain areas and they simply don't have enough jobs, you know, but the messaging is clear. It's clear. Risi over Nigeria, thanks for tuning in. Great to have you. Um, Lance, I understand 100% your comment here. I'm honestly stressed. Why charge us such exorbitant school fees for a false dream? I agree. I'm with you. Um, good to see you, Andy. Thanks for connecting in. And 
Edom says, do you recognize the FSW draws return soon? Not FSW, no program specified, I think is where we're at. Okay, we've reached the end of the questions that have been posted here. I hope this was helpful for you guys. Uh, those of you who are tuning in just at the very, very end of the uh, the live stream, we did a little bit of a watch party where we listened to Minister Miller, who had um, made some announcements about changes to the programs. And we've talked about those. Hopefully you've been able to see, but go back. This will be a recording you can watch wherever you're listening on your live stream. But these are big, big changes. And Minister Miller right here, he's disappearing on me. Let's see if we can shrink him down here. Minister Miller right here, we'll stick him right here. Um, he announced um, just today uh, some changes that are only at the very, very earliest stages. And ultimately, going forward, understand if you're an international student, you need to realize that the decisions that you make to come and study in Canada, you have to be strategic. You absolutely need to, to book a consult or speak to an immigration, um, someone who you trust uh, in our firm. Obviously, I'd love for you to talk to me so that I can help you, so that I can explain to you how this is all going to play out, including where you want to study. And, and we don't, we're not education agents, so we don't link schools with, with students. Our job isn't to, um, to, to find uh, to students for schools to fill their, their admission um, to, you know, quotas. Our job is to help you to know, okay, if I go to this school, what possibilities do I have? And those are the kind of things that we're going to do as a, as a firm going forward. Try to help people in advance because right now, the only thing people do is they go to someone in their home country that's an education agent who's working for specific schools that want you to go to specific schools that are paid to get you at specific schools. Please, please, please remember that if your goal is permanent residence, that needs to be something you think about at the very, very front end. And that's something that we're going to be doing as a, as, a, as a firm. So I recommend that you slide over to our firm and click on speak to a lawyer and book a consultation with myself, Alicia or Igor and uh, minister here. will just have you disappear, minister. Um, book a consult and we can help you to sort through a long-term plan. And like I said, I don't, we don't help. We're not education agents, but we can help you to figure out a strategy or even better. Well, I shouldn't say better, but just as valuable is to say, hey, maybe you should think about not studying in Canada because you just really are not going to have a big, uh, a significant pathway to permanent residence if that is your true goal. Okay. All right. Uh, looks like we have just a few, few more. Uh, oh, and actually I want to share one other thing with you guys as well. Those who are looking to study in Canada, some of you are thinking to yourselves, well, I just don't know how to do it. And that's why I, I can get accepted to a school. I know where I can go to, you know, to study. Uh, there's a program I love, but I just, I don't know how to go about putting together a solid study permit application. Well, I have a course for that, you guys, and very few people subscribe to it. But this course right here is awesome. It goes through every possible thing that you could need to know or understand or learn on how to be successful with your study permit application. From start to finish, all the way through, it's a step-by-step -step guide, whether you're applying through a GC key or through the IRCC portal. And, um, I strongly encourage you guys who are looking to study in Canada to take a look at this. And all you have to do is go to the Canadian Immigration Institute website and the study permit courses are all right there. You can find them uh, the, easily, the courses, immigration courses, explore courses, and then express entry, study permits, spousal sponsorship. We've got a bunch of courses. And if you are someone who just wants to understand what this system is all about, how it works, um, go subscribe to the course, review the lessons, review the material, Take advantage of all of the supports, the 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 templates and the the um, the you know the worksheets that are designed to help you develop an excellent study plan. All those things that are critical. So that's there, and and you can educate yourself. And if you choose to hire someone else to help you, um, then at least you are prepared, so you're not going to be duped. Okay, you're not going to fall into that same situation as those other uh, international students. Okay, we've had a few more questions pop in. I'll answer a few more and then and then we'll wrap it up. Okay. Um, okay, Hot Pizza says, so it's basically the benefits of being a student paying triple times the regular fees and with no certainty of P a PR path. Yes, that's exactly it. That's, you can sum it up just like that. Um, Amarpreet, you're very welcome. Nestor, thanks for tuning in as well. Thank you. Mimi Bear, thanks for connecting in. Um, 
And then Vincent says, then they should have marketed trade schools more internationally. It's not that simple. It's not that simple. Um, it's, it's, there's a multifaceted problem with the trade schools uh, just because trades are not designed in the same way as regular post-secondary education to have pathways to permanent residence. It's a much more complex situation than that, Vincent. Um, uh, hoping trades, a category-based draws is done soon, maybe next week, maybe, maybe. Um, okay, Talis says, yep, I do recommend it talking with Mark. Thanks, Talis, I appreciate that. Um, Okay, Martha says, hey, Martha. She says, hey, Mark, it's been a long time since I saw your incredible content. I received my PR under the TR to PR. I'm so grateful to you and your content. I'm so happy for you, Martha. I love getting that. Um, Solaris says, hey, Mark, is there any chance to get permanent residency as a truck driver? There is. It de just depends on where you're going and who you're working for. Okay, um, Akram says, Mark is probably the most reputable YouTuber. His views are always spot on and you can count on them. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. All right, guys, let's wrap it up. Remember, um, Alicia and I will be back on Wednesday with another live Q&A. Um, but I also want to point out once again, like I do every time it seems like we have a, uh, we do a live stream, there's a ton of content. Go to the YouTube channel, watch the past videos, go to our website. We have an amazing uh, blog that uh, is just chock full of information. Man, I'm always having trouble with this. Okay. <laughs> Here's our blog. You can search through all of the content topics. It's always timely. There's just a ton of information that you can glean here. Um, and then obviously we we have our Canadian Immigration Podcast, which I absolutely love. And, and uh, Alicia and I are working through these topics. If you want to know how the Temporary Foreign Worker Program works and just going through all of the different uh, areas of, of working in Canada, we've got a huge series, business immigration series we're doing on the podcast. Definitely check that out. Um, Yes, that podcast, I think, is one of the first podcasts, really meaningful podcasts that uh, uh, that was created for immigration. And I'm really, really proud of the Canadian Immigration Podcast. So check that out. Lots of content. All right, guys, thanks for joining. It was a pleasure having all of you here. And uh, yes, you're very welcome, Adela. Take care, you guys. We'll see you again soon.